Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our lecture six on accelerators and graphical processing units. It is an interesting lecture in two ways, basically. It gives us, firstly, another way of a programming model. So that means the way how we program in parallel with MPI and OpenMP is basically different than we do it in GPUs. However, we will connect a little bit to shared memory programming in lecture five that we had the last time, uh, which there are basically are concepts around which do it a little bit similar like graphical processing units, but you would still consider this as a little bit of different programming um, than traditional open MP shared memory programming, of course. And secondly, this lecture is interesting because it connects us nicely to the success of deep learning, a machine learning um, basically approach that in the meantime got quite some momentum, is very successful, and we will learn that the most success is basically not only in the models of deep learning, of course, but also in the computing power that we have available through graphical processing units. So let's look before we dive into lecture six, however, what we had the last time, and this was really basically programming in another way than MPI, but with OpenMP. And OpenMP, we learned, was around shared memory programming. So in this sense, we learned there are two setups of shared memory. This uniform memory access, where we said every CPU has basically access to this shared address space of memory. And it's very uniform, as we can see here. And there's a non-uniform memory access where we see that there are a couple of CPUs that have memory, basically have also indirectly, so to speak, a bus interconnect approach to remote memory. And in a way, it would be like looking like distributed memory now. So many of you would think, well, that's not really shared memory. It's a bit more uh, distributed memory. But it's basically distributed memory, which is logically shared memory, because there's a bus interconnect and make sure that we can still address the address space, although it's distributed and makes also, of course, the corrections to basically do this in a way that's not harmful. <clears throat> then when we also think about um, the way how now shared memory works, we were comparing this a little bit to the processors uh, or processes that we had in distributed memory that did lots of communication exchange, if you remember, between the processes. If you model shared memory, it's much more around, yeah, basically lightweight threads and several one of them. And the key benefit, of course, that all of them to program in parallel and to work in parallel is here to basically read and write to shared memory, as these arrows suggest. Hence, something like MPI for message exchanges are basically not really used here. We communicate, if you want this term, a little bit through the shared memory. Right, so basically this is the idea. Um, of course, this is limited based on the amount of memory I have. And it gives us when we do, let's say, a certain standard on it, quite some portability today with the OpenMP that we learned from the last lecture. We can be quite sure that when you have an OpenMP application on one machine, it probably also runs on another HPC machine because today you would say that the OpenMPI specification and its implementations are really available on all the different HPC machines. Obviously, the amount of memory is different in all the different generations of HPC machines, which is important here to realize. When we come then to the real idea how that works practically, once you have an OpenMP application, we have said there's one thread which is quite important because this is the lifeline of the program itself. You see that here, which is here, the master thread one. It will be basically over the whole idea of the OpenMP application. And how OpenMP works is basically always um, kind of forking off several threads in the parallel region to perform some work activities. These work activities can be, of course, different. Could be a, sometimes maybe a loop, a for loop, or a do loop. Um, could be different sections to do. We learned there are different ways how you can basically use uh, this parallel region is different so-called work sharing constructs. And this is now an important part also that you see in this graphic. Not at all always have to be the number of threads equal. When we come now to the practical programming perspective, how we really have source code and so on, we see 
that basically the way how you do the open standard open MP implementation in a program is different. There, I don't have any more this kind of MPI ENET, MPI finalized uh, that you know already from the MPI. Here we rather have so-called direct basically statements, this kind of pragma statements, this compiler directives that basically inform the compiler that this should be executed in parallel. So the way how many threads are available is also not hard coded as you see inside the code. Instead, we give it as one parameter in the job script like you have here with OMP number threads equals four. And then when we basically execute this with this kind of execution scripts once I have this hello world example here compiled, we will by in the execution know the pragma statement will do in parallelization of it and the number of parallelization will be derived from this statement again in this job script. So hence you can also do maximum number of threads eight and then you would have hello world eight times. Quite an interesting way. So still think about it, what it means when you now think about this picture I was alluding to here. This also means there would be one of the kind of threads, the master threads, which you would say has quite a unique importance because it will also do the work itself, but also will have um, different in parallel threads that work in the parallel regions. The way how there could be parallel regions was different. Um, we said again, the master thread will fork some of these teams of threads if you want to, and then there will be joins and the master thread will continue. And we see there was this do and for loop, a very common way of parallelizing um, loops in the application, which you can use essentially again with Pragma. Then you would have uh, different sections that you can program and maybe not all of the ones in the thread pool really basically has to execute this. Um, as this graphic also suggests, there may be more threads available, but I just have three sections here. And then basically you see single, which really means only one thread at the time basically is using this here and the others doing not anything here. So there are some other constructs where basically uh, we're alluding to critical regions that basically if you want to read and write a variable, um, this needs to be specially protected, especially if many threads read and write almost at the same time from this variable, right? There could be race conditions around this variable, wrong values, lost updates, and so on. So that's why there must be also civil um, constructs like critical regions to protect those. Then <clears throat> towards the end of this lecture, there we have learned um, that there was a parallel application, which we know already from MPI, um, where we said there was this HP DB scan, the high performance uh, DB scan algorithm for clustering. You see here a laser point cloud of the inner city of Bremen that was basically reconstructed based on the DB scan clustering algorithm. So it clustered back, so to speak, the whole buildings because they, of course, have more reflections and so on. And uh, the way this is programmed, this program is interesting because it not only is an MPI application, it also has OpenMP work constructs in it. And you see here in the job script, we use, for instance, a thread number of four, while still basically, if you look at the source code, you have basically an MPI version, but intermixed basically also with here Pragma OMP parallel four. So a typical way how to basically um, then do a kind of loop parallelization and based basically what we also have here in the job script, we could steer, of course, a parallelization of that, which does more or less a local DB scan using shared memory as much as possible, and then basically uh, merging this with HALO regions and MPI again to the bigger picture of basically this. And we have seen what we don't have seen here in the slide here today, but what we have seen in the last lecture, this hybrid implementation, as we would call it, with MPI and OpenMP together of course, yields quite good performance on the one hand, but of course, the source code then is also not at all so easy to understand anymore. It's quite a very massive and good application in parallel. And obviously, if you combine both of these constructs, um, it's basically a parallel programming, which is quite intensive already. So quite an advanced concept. And we stop here with this because we want to focus more on CFD and hence we will dive a little bit more in another idea how you program in parallel
which brings us now to lecture six on accelerators on graphical processing units. You will learn a little bit about the basics again that we will review um, the many cores, why they have so much impact right now in the top 500 as in the last couple of years. Then the terminology, why we call it accelerator, um, why is NVIDIA so dominant here? Although we have to say these days they are AMD and different vendors come along that more and more have also other GPU architectures. But we will review a little bit the ones that we know from the past from NVIDIA architectures like Kepler, Pascal, Volta, Ampere. And then understanding also how you basically now build the HPC system with GPUs and CPUs. And we will take essentially one of the leading HPC systems in the world, the summit, basically as one blueprint to understand that a little bit better, especially if you then also want to interconnect these GPUs. You will learn that essentially one GPU alone uh, will help us significantly in deep learning, especially in the next lecture. But if you have access to much more GPUs, as we will learn in HPC machines, you can nicely interconnect them with NVLink, NV switches, what we call so-called islands per nodes, but then can also use basically different internode programming that we will learn with Horovod and others to do distributed deep learning, what we also will discuss a little bit then in the next lecture, um, and then really can scale up and make the faster learning possible for deep learning. So deep learning and so on will be introduced, uh, so don't worry, we will talk about this a little bit today, but then much more based in the next lecture. And after this lecture, you know quite a bit of the basics of GPUs, how a node looks like when you integrate different types of GPUs and how this works also with the memory, which we should not forget. Then the second part should be a little bit more applications of it. Again, we will review the deep learning, of course, being one of the most successful applications, perhaps these days of GPUs. We will talk about this Horobot interconnect, which interestingly enough, brings us back to MPI. It's implemented with an all reduce and we will talk about it. And we have simulation sciences libraries, simulation sciences in the sense that those are rather used for uh, numerical methods based on known physical laws, applications in physics, uh, basically you name it, uh, lots of different applications, but there are several of these libraries which are used again and again, for instance, those for basically the algebra uh, and so forth that we will review and learn that many of those are these days also ported to GPUs. Then we have to talk about some drawbacks in the sense that NVIDIA GPUs are proprietary programmed with the so-called CUDA, the Compute Unified Device Architecture as a certain language, but then also um, look at this kind of drawback from a positive direction that basically new vendors with the AMD Instinct cards that we have now in the Lumi supercomputer in Finland, where also Iceland is part of, or the Frontier, they drive a more standardization in the field so that we basically have this open ec and hip new standards coming on the horizon and are already partly used to really uh, try really to basically do what we can in order to make a standard happen so that one vendor is not so dominant in having all these libraries. This is not at all obvious and actually it's also quite challenging these days. NVIDIA is quite a market share and is quite uh, in front and has quite optimized libraries if you want. With Nickel uh, would be one idea, very low level for, you know, library for deep learning but then also data loaders, um, the DALI data loader is an example, for instance, that you could nicely combine this Horobot, for instance, for multi-GPU um, learning. So different elements where basically many different vendors still have to catch up. And of course, the standards can in one way also help this. With this, we hope to give you a lot of um, insights and promises back from the previous lectures before. And we'll also think about some learning outcomes here. Um, of course, definitely have another complex aspect of parallel programming uh, performed if you think about accelerators of using GPUs, then it is really an HPC environment tool in a way, the whole environment around it, so CUDA, but also the way how you basically program an accelerator or a GPU. Um, this is something where these days in the applications, it's probably something you really need to have. It's not anymore enough to just know basically MPI and OpenMP. The knowledge of accelerators and GPUs is crucial today. And with this, you can really then also program and use HPC 
um, applications more and more and understand, of course, existing codes also more and more. So a very, let's say, again, practical oriented topic. But before we go more in the idea how you program it, let's look a little bit where this comes from. The name already suggested general purpose graphical processing units. So we're not talking here about the gaming, but we have basically contrasted it already a little bit to the existence of this multi-core CPUs in the past. And I will be very quick here. We know the CPU by now has a very high single thread performance per core is very, let's say, generating a lot of heat. And with this, we have some limits to put more and more of these cores really next to one chip. And the idea then of this many core uh, was essentially derived from this GPU idea that was actually used for gaming, right? So basically before NVIDIA was quite known um, in the gaming industry with NVIDIA GeForce cards, for instance, where they basically have lots of games accelerated by GPUs and used for graphics, as the name suggests. But basically what then was come along the line is that this is more used for general other applications, not only computer vision, not only graphics, but also for basically high performance applications. And this was coming basically relatively slow into the market. It was not at all clear that this will be basically really working because also the way how you program this was quite different. Uh, if you remember what we will also review a little bit later on is we always have to go through the host CPU, the host CPU alongside the GPU in order to get to the device memory and fill it with data in order to put the all different um, processors to work. But we also learned that the many core, as the name suggests, has many of those processors, but they're not high single thread performance. So they're moderately fast uh, cores, but have, of course, then really in the thousands, where yeah, more or less they are simple cores, really. Um, but because you have so many of them, they can still do another type of parallelization. And these days you would say um, it is invented in gaming in the past, but now you would find almost all HPC and cloud-based systems that have GPUs today. So it becomes more or less a very important technology in HPC. And the way how that LS accelerates, I was already um, talking to this a little bit uh, when we now think about the idea of this, for instance, as an example here, it is beautiful for problems where it's, for instance, used also in deep learning for this kind of uh, matrix, matrix multiplications, uh, going here from one deep layer to another deep layer where the learning takes place. We will talk about this also in lecture seven later, basically much more in detail. But then the idea is to have something that you could parallelize which basically has a very simple setup that's always the same as you have here the matrix vector multiplication, for instance, right? The color coding says that all it's independent from all the other areas, right? So you can nicely solve this matrix vector multiplication by just thinking about the colors and pair color put that to a GPU. And with this, you have a very nice way of filling the GPU. And obviously that's standing just um, for, you know, applications which usually have much, much, much more bigger matrices and vectors than I just here explaining with a four by four matrix, for examples. So they're very nice uh, in accelerate the computing um, where this massively parallel still, but with relatively, let's say, low moderate performance threads, where basically a thread then does some interesting computation, which is not at all number crunching, but could be a very interesting idea just having here for instance one part of the matrix multiplied with one scalar here and you see here as an example from hpc um, that they basically here also are now available in many different areas of physics one example i wanted to bring here is amber which is basically a molecular dynamics package um, that you have and basically you see here they tried out a lot of different types of gpus and basically um you know architectures if you have here kepler 80 board one gpu and you see here how the performance is basically if you look at all of these different um basically cards what you can do and uh, basically this is around atomic simulation so a very specific way of physics um, where you basically have different types of gpus used for it so hence these topics um about old application libraries like Ember to port them to GPUs is a very popular topic. 
And uh, this came along mostly with the large success of NVIDIA, we have to say, which basically um, was entering the GPU market uh, very um, successfully with different eras, really. So we look back on something called Fermi, then a long time was Kepler and Maxwell. Now, basically, we have lots of Pascal, Volta and Ampere uh, NVIDIA cards uh, here. They're usually called like V100, like Volta 100. You see here an A100 for Ampere 100. And these cores have been over the time of this era more and more um, basically specialized really for different purposes. You see here a Tensor core, which um, actually basically is a Tensor's nothing else than a multidimensional array that you basically want to maybe compute alongside all of these deep learning networks, which we'll learn also in the next lecture or have seen in the past slide. So basically we're there. Um, you see over these generations really a much better performance. And these days you would say it's really optimized also for training AI models, so artificial intelligence models like deep learning models I was alluding to. And you see here the kind of speed up um, of here when you see just the V100 cards that were very popular uh, relatively, uh, well, not long time ago versus the new generation of A100 then where you have a one time speed up or basically also here three times speed up. And the one that this also suggests in that not only what I said the last time, the, the huge amounts of cores are responsible for the speed up. We also should not forget that the memory is basically a very important part of this. Right, so we will learn that today the NVIDIA cards, and you see this already here in the slide, is 40 gigabytes or 80 gigabytes. Um, this refers to the memory models that we have available. And of course, the more memory you have, the more faster you have a throughput and can get up to much more speed in learning. <laughs> Hence, it's not only the many core itself, it's also the alongside memory, which helps us here obviously to achieve some interesting speed up especially because it's more data parallel, as it's suggesting, right? If you jump back to the last slide, this is data parallel nicely, right? You can just independently compute this. And if you have a very matrix, very large matrices, many of them to compute, only the limit you have is the memory. That's why the device memory here and its size um, is also an, an important factor where we not really have focused on in the past. We always were saying just the many cores are responsible that's not completely true. The more you have here, the more it makes sense also to increase the device memory. And this is what's done up to the point where would you say today, really, this is more the bottleneck these days uh, to really fuel the GPU with a lot of data early enough through the CPUs or maybe even through the interconnects for different GPUs. We will talk about this in a minute. Let us look how this was evolution basically then um, come along with perhaps also some other architectures. We have seen that Intel was working on the Theons, uh, which basically was an idea also in the future where you would maybe have and come to a GPU that is at the same time also host CPU and GPU. So it was basically an idea that this could be combined, but this was stopped in some point in time. While you see here also the NVIDIA line, uh, the green one with the Tesla GPUs, uh, kind of Maxwell, Kepler's, and, and so on, where really here with Pascal and Volta and leaving out even Ampere here, uh, which we have today, uh, and so on, we're really um, striving here. And unfortunately, some of these architectures have not really uh, basically pursued more like the Intel Xeon Phi's, Knight's nice Landing chips, where some of the performances were perhaps comparable. But as I said, at some point in time, this was also stopped. What is also important to see is that we have still the line of AMD Radeon GPUs. Um, and this is today also continued with AMD chips, which we will talk on later, which is a bit out here in the, uh, in basically stopping here and suggesting there's nothing anymore from AMD, but that's also not true there. Basically also new chips there. So quite an interesting journey. Um, basically through the time, basically the last 10 years, starting really with the kind of Tesla architectures, where at that point in time, very early on, nobody was really clear what impact in GPU would have just 10 years later. 
And this impact is best shown, and you see the top 500 list. I have here a list which is a little bit a year old uh, or so, so that doesn't really matter. It's from 2021, and we have some statistics here, but you see also quite um, that every of these systems nowadays in the top 500 have some way of having an accelerator. Um, here's a summit architecture we will look into more, which has uh, basically the NVIDIA Volta V100. Then basically you see here a system in Germany at that point in time was number eight in November 2021. Also there we had basically NVIDIA A100 uh, Mellanox um, interconnect here in Finiband and so on. But you see also when you look into the statistics more on this at that time it was US first uh, number one in the top 500, basically the best in Europe system. It had already 3,744 GPUs. And this is possible through lots of compute nodes, right? As you would say, you see here 936 compute nodes where each of them has an AMD EPIC ROM processor um, and basically a 24 core, two times, etc. But you see also alongside these, we would call that an accelerated node. You will see always that each of these nodes has also four NVIDIA A100 cards, GPUs. And you see also this kind of four times, so this was alluding to before, it's not only of having the Ampere 100 here and the many cores, you also would look these days on how much of the HBM memory um, you have and here it was four times 40 gigabytes A100 cards. So, and with the number of compute nodes, you come then by calculating this to round uh, 3,700 GPUs. So quite many, if you think about that, we were in gaming, usually used to have one GPU in our desktop computer to accelerate gaming. We're here on a complete different level with having thousands of GPUs available for science and engineering. Um, you're a little bit from the vendor share. Um, this is, of course, now intermixed with the CPU business, with many other businesses, especially Fugaku, who is still um, basically one of the top systems in the world, has a very specific um, basically processor itself is basically this Fujitsu in a very close collaboration, has a very specific internet interconnect with Tofu, and that's why it's also one of the high performance ones. You see, however, the power is quite immense, if you think also about the energy efficient of these systems. But I think it becomes clear if you go from line to line, NVIDIA is here in the third system. Um, you go down NVIDIA A100 cards in Perlmutter, and so on and so on, Selene A100, um, and so on and so on. NVIDIA Tesla in number nine. So you see with this, the GPUs have quite a big impact in all of these different um, supercomputers today. So let's look at some of the machines a little bit more to understand what I'm saying in a practical example. So again, we have um, basically here a system which is really a large leadership system. It has actually around 4,600 nodes. Right, so this is a, a big field. This is two tennis courts of basically just having racks. So really a big scale um, in terms of space. Everything has, you know, kind of cooling. Basically there's the interconnects between the different racks and so on. So it has basically EVM, Power9 CPUs um, inside um, from Intel per node and six GPUs, right, per node. So that's quite massive if you think about it right so that gives us even more than the jewel system had by orders of magnitude which means we are lying here in the 27,000 region of gpus so obviously a large system um, as i said was one of the top systems and is still one of the top systems in the world um, and has six gpus as one per node which makes it also so high in terms of the part of the top 500 now, another view on this is basically now a kind of more in-depth variant of what you have already seen. So I talked to you before that basically we have this host CPUs, right, that we have seen um, that is available here. And there were two of them. And basically these have then basically, as you would call it per node, uh, basically here this six GPUs, right? So they're directly connected to the host CPU. And with the NVLink interconnect, you have basically also a quite nice interconnect between all these different GPUs available. 
So this is a kind of cutting edge systems. Having six per node is very aggressive if you want. So hence it's a system which has so many and is so powerful. But of course you can imagine what that means in terms of costs, right? So having a GPU inside a system is expensive. Having very many of them is massively expensive, especially if you think you have six per node. So you would have four per node in the Jewel system, here six per node, uh, that's quite impressive. How that looks now in the more interconnect area, um, basically is that you have, again, the idea of the memory here that we have not neglected. We have the GPUs and what you should see a little bit from the interconnect is also the massive bandwidth here that you have to memory, right? And while the interconnect between the different GPUs, for instance, is at 50 gigabytes per second, um, we can access the direct memory with 900 gigabytes per second. So that's extremely fast. And here is also the connection to the CPU. Basically what we learned, the EBM power um, two times the, the CPUs, where each of them has three GPUs, as this graphic suggests, on the one side and on the other side. But you see clearly um, that this is a very high bandwidth, which is now the one of the success factors as well of a GPU, that you basically can access the memory very fast making the bottleneck more or less here when you think about also the speed that you have to normal RAM here, normal memory from the host CPUs, it's just 170 gigabytes. It's still, of course, access to memory still faster than the network here, but compared to the HBM that we have here in, within the GPUs, it's still very different. And of course, we go lower in performance as, so, as when we then also go uh, basically to storage and so on, but that's not so important here. I think this is much more important to realize that the, the memory from a GPU can be very quickly accessed and how this now looks like on the more practical perspective is a cutting edge setup in a node of a HPC system. And now, as I was saying, this has around, if I remember correctly, 4,700 nodes. Uh, the summit uh, basically has the real number here. Yeah, it's 4,600, sorry. Still, you can imagine lots of them and with this um, a very massive number of GPUs in total. Now, looking a little bit more um, into this memory, um, I was saying again, the memory bandwidth is very high. And the interesting thing is that this um, JDEC is basically um, a kind of sanitization activity that more or less has standardized this HBM to the factor that basically HBM is also usable with other cards, right? It is not bound to just NVIDIA cards. And, and this is... Uh, a kind of important step, I think, in the community of HPC to enable this massive bandwidth throughput that you have here with up to 900 gigabytes per GPU, also for others. Um, basically, of course, these also suggest you need them very close to each other, right? So you don't think about the normal Ethernet connection or so that you would have. And you would see also the CPU, as we have seen in the other one, the picture is also to the memory still some quiet performance, making it today more or less that you see here in the in the red line, right, which suggests the same throughput here with 16 gigabytes. The the real kind of drawback we have these days is more or less how we come from a CPU to the own accelerator, right? So this is some restriction in the bandwidth that we kind of want to avoid. And when you think about that, the accelerators might be directly connected to each other or so um, having access to all of these memory bandwidths would be one step forward where people are here and they're working on. And let's look on this later. Let us look, however, what we mean with tensor cores. You see a little bit how this is basically now alluding to in the Pascal versus Evolta tensor cores in different floating points like 16 versus 32, which is much more fine granular. And um, sometimes you would say the more in deep learning um, you have basically might be not the best idea because you have regularization effects, don't take every data sample by heart and the learning from it. So it's probably enough to have a mixed precision of uh, basically floating point 16 lower precision um, to do deep learning. And the tens, of course, are really oriented towards this uh, having, let's say, um, really an interesting way of uh, making it very fast, this kind of matrix multiplication or matrix matrix multiplication and so on through this tensor cross, um, because then the precision 
of course, is what usually takes a lot of time to compute. But if you can reduce on that, you already um, save some time. And we will see that the impact in deep learning is usually not really massive. It's quite the other way around. You can much more speed up the learning by having more speed. So, um, yeah, from this, you see some um, ideas of deep learning impacts here, which I said is one of the major application areas. Um, with the V100, then with the Pascal 100, um, the time to solution um, that you have here is, is basically um, one level up again from the Pascal to the V100. You see here, again, uh, we save quite 10 hours here in the learning in this particular example and so on. And uh, we will also see more examples on this when we um, you know, later look also into the deep learning. So from this NVLink perspective, um, this is a direct GPU to GPU interconnect um, that basically six NVLINKs connections are possible. And you can have there basically then this kind of shared bandwidth, um, which you can then basically interconnect and um, basically have more access to the different other memory. And with this have also very direct communication between the GPUs. But still, you see just doing six together, um, for instance, um, and, and then with NV switches, perhaps a bit more, uh, you have still islands that's hard to scale up to many, many different thousands of cores that we have seen before, right? We call them therefore still islands. Everything which goes above this will not benefit anymore from these kind of things alone. Of course, inherently, yes, but if you interconnect them, um, still the interconnect will be the limiting factor. Um, these are things which are, for instance, also a matter of research in the deep project that you already know. So I can go a bit faster here. It's a modular supercomputer we discussed many times, where, for instance, one approach against this kind of island and against the limitations of this NVLink and vSwitch islands was more or less to use uh, essentially the host CPU only for a communication device, for instance, with MPI, and then suggesting that the kernels itself, so the kernels are basically part of the GPUs, will basically see sensor results directly through the network and not anymore basically, um, you know, using always as it is normally from the compute CPU, having this in the host memory, the data is uploaded, the results are downloaded in the host CPU, and then from there, MPI to do the other CPUs. So essentially, again, the, the kind of typical offload, as you would say, from the compute and host CPU should be basically done by an optimized offload. So basically saying that we have used much more the communication uh, here between them directly, uh, which is better of ongoing research and sometimes basically also quite a realization already through the so-called GPU direct interface. But these are already advanced topics of GPUs. I just wanted to say that the limits of scaling are basically not directly existing. You can definitely now interconnect 500, 600, whatever, 1,000 GPU cores. That's not the limit. There are other limits in the end in deep learning we will talk about next time, which is our rather the problem of large batch sizes and so on we have to talk to. Of course, not all these systems are so big. We have our you know, basically the data analytics module that we have here also in the course as part of the deep system, where you then have, for instance, just one NVIDIA, you know, V100 per node, but still interconnecting them can still make a big difference if you have deep learning applications in your university or wherever you basically have access to these systems. This is, uh, of course, also something you have to realize and to think about once you go out of the course and have access to systems like here, for instance, in the university, we have a GARPRO cluster right now. And basically already we started with the ELIA system now, which has actually a couple of GPUs inside, right? So this is something where if you are interested in GPU, uh, basically this is important to think about. You can have here GPUs in the node and you see here also, basically we have here Maxwell or Volta's uh, even in this system, but you have just, let's say one, or so um, that are available here and there in one node. But think about that you always have the possibility usually to interconnect them. And this could already, let's say, help you a lot to basically achieve more performance. Right, and with this, I'm already done for the first part. Um, I think here is an interesting video that kind of visually 
reflects what I was talking about, having this high throughput of, let's say, very basic tasks, right? But you have just thousands of them in parallel, where the host CPU usually has to do some quite work uh, to make the parallelization happening. It's, of course, much more faster, but still has this limit that when you have the GPU comparison here, painting the Mona Lisa, it will give you some insight. So we break here for 10 minutes, and we basically see us 